Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see everybody here. I want to thank you for making it uh, uh, your choice to come out to church today and to worship together. That's always exciting when the body of Christ gets together to, to worship, and uh, uh, I am so happy to be back home uh, again. We took a little vacation, went up north uh, where we have a family cabin and our family gets together. It's good to be with the grandkids and uh, uh, we spent some time doing that. But the best thing about grandkids, and you'll agree, is you can give them back. <laughs> my goodness. I realized that my oldest grandson is um, maturing late because I heard all about the terrible twos, but he's three now and he's in the middle of it. That's... So it, it was so much fun. But uh, I think after it was over, Colette needed a vacation. Uh, she had a full-time job going on. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yesterday, uh, my wife and I, we had the privilege to uh, travel to Dearborn Heights, Michigan, for a, a, a wedding. And uh, it was uh, such a joyous occasion to go back and see uh, some old friends. But this particular couple that got married, um, they met when they were 10 right? Ten years old. And uh, they've never been apart. <laughs> they, uh, they've never dated other people. They have always been together. So you know how at the end of a marriage uh, ceremony these days, they love to use the technology and the screens, and you get uh, a family uh, uh, slideshow from the time they were born all the way up to uh, the day of their wedding. And we got that, and it was so funny because after about... They're like this big. All of a sudden, all the pictures of them are together. And I've never been to a, a wedding where the family pictures are all together, and yet they're totally separate families. It's not like uh, um, it just happened that this is the way it was. It was such a neat and unique uh, wedding ceremony. It was a lot of fun. Wedding ceremonies, when you, when you kind of look at a wedding ceremony, you're really talking about a, a covenant relationship that is being made between uh, a husband and a, and, a, and a wife. And they uh, have made this choice to come together and have God bless their relationship. And it was very, very uh, uh, fun to see them make this conscious decision to to invite God uh, to be a part of them. They're, they're both uh, uh, wonderful uh, Christian young people, and, and, uh, but yet you realize that God was the most important thing in their relationship, and, and that was, was fun to watch. And yet the scripture that we talk about today in the story uh, focuses on that same covenant that we make, you know, to one another. But this covenant that we make is with, with God. And it's our most important covenant relationship is between man and the creator, the one true God. And uh, we, we come to the end in our, in our story um, um, series, if you will. We're not coming to the end of the stories, but we, we come to the end of the Old Testament portion of our journey. So the whole uh, stories is like 38, 39 weeks uh, of a series, which is really a long series. But at the same time, each and every individual is standalone, and yet it builds on the next. So if you didn't come uh, last week and hear the particular message about that chapter of the story, you can come the next week and you, you won't miss uh, uh, as far as, it's not like uh, going to the Oprah book club and you didn't watch the first eight or nine chapters, listen to the first eight or nine chapters, you're done. So this particular story that we, we uh, is, is builds on one another, but they stand alone. So we have watched throughout our Old Testament journey of this story about the fact that there has been a covenant relationship. I just want to read a scripture that we read earlier in this, uh, in this uh, story. And I want to focus on this particular scripture this morning. Even though we're, we're really looking at Ezra, Nehemiah, um, uh, and Malachi today, we're, we really want to focus on this as being the pretense of all of those uh, minor prophets. Uh, so, so help me out here. And I'm going to ask that uh, we can do something a little different than we've done. I'm going to invite you all to stand. Uh, and I want to invite you all to read along with me as we read this scripture uh, together. So uh, this scripture is very important because of 
the covenant. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These words you are to speak to the Israelites. You may be seated. So the, the whole message in the Old Testament is one of relationship. And the relationship is between God and his people. And now, you know, when it comes to covenant, there was one thing that was constant in the covenant, and that was God. God was the constant. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never changed. He has never broken his promise. He has never moved away from it. And, and we still trust and believe that that's the case today, and it is. And that's, that's the very fact is that God's covenant with us is just as real as it was back when he made a covenant with the people in the Old Testament. The other thing that is very constant in this whole entire process is that the covenant has been broken, 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 (laughs) broken. You get in the picture? Broken, broken, broken. And each and every time it's broken, there's consequence. And the consequence is always one that is very real to all of us. And the consequence of this broken covenant is that we fall out of righteousness with God. See, the covenant was designed so that we, God's people, and God are in this relationship together. And it's a righteous relationship. And from the very beginning of time, Adam and Eve, something happened where that covenant relationship was broken. And when that covenant relationship is broken, it's really not the way it was designed to be. God has a plan, and his plan is perfect, and yet we change it sometimes because we fall out of a proper relationship with our Heavenly Father. When that happens, they they call that sin. And, and sin is, is for a simple definition, and it's very complex, it's very complicated, and the sermon not, is today is not on sin, but just for today, for thinking in terms of, of our, uh, our, our message this morning, we're going to call sin a very simple thing, it's separation from God. So when we sin, we actually choose to separate ourselves from God. See, when we're in a proper relationship with God, we are in his presence and he asks us to be holy because he's holy and and that's that's scriptural that's not something that's made up but he wants us to be holy because he is holy and he gives us his holy spirit kind of holy because i'm holy i'll give you the holy spirit it's kind of that missing link that when we separate ourselves from God, and we don't have the Holy Spirit a part of our lives, it's really hard to remain in that righteous relationship with our Creator. And so this is all about covenant and the relationship that God has with us and we have with God. It's also about the relationship that we have with our fellow man. When we're in a right relationship with God, it's so much easier to be in a right relationship with our fellow man. And when we're not in a right relationship with our fellow man, it's much more difficult to be in a right relationship with God. So you kind of start seeing how all of this story stuff comes together. It's, it's connected, and yet it's so distinctively different. And so we try to understand that today. Now, you know that throughout the history of Israel, they went through some stuff. And uh, matter of fact, if you turn on the news today and you watch Fox or CNN, you're going to get two different pictures of what's really going on. And if you watch the BBC, which kind of like I like to watch, it's a little bit more <laughs> less biased. Uh, but we have a, a, a situation going on right now in Israel where the Palestines, the Palestinians, and the Israelites are at conflict with each other. That really isn't news. 
It's been going on now for thousands of years. That news <laughs> is today's hot, hot headline, but the story has been going on for a really long time. Very much back when this guy named Abraham was born and he had two kids from two different wives. Sort of started back then. I wasn't around then, but I heard it wasn't much different than it is right now. You know, um, in part of these conflicts that have been going on, Israel at times has been captive. They've been held captive in Egypt, and they've been held captive in the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And these kingdoms actually have names, but we, we kind of just use generic terms in the Bible. But, but in this particular time, Israel has just gone through another one of its really bad separation times. And basically, during this time, the Israelites just pretty much decided they were going to be like everybody else. And so they started worshiping uh, the gods of all the other countries that were around them. And uh, to be frankly honest, this angered God. And some of them were actually uh, held captive and taken away. And, and they lived in um, uh, Persia, which is actually Iran. So if you put all this together right now in, in the, 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 the map that we know right now, we're, we're looking at Iran, a conflict between Iran and Israel. Now, if you listen to the news, Iran today, in this modern day, is actually funding Hezbollah in Lebanon and funding Hamas in uh, Gaza, and you have Israel. And, you know, some people have taken sides with uh, Hezbollah and, and uh, uh, Hamas and says, that what they're doing is, is righteous and that's what they should be doing. And others have taken side with Israel and said what they're doing is what's going. But remember, when we're talking the covenant is it's hard to get along <laughs> with this group and this group when you're not getting along with God. And honestly, my friends, if we could get them all into a room and that they could make a decision, it's that simple. <laughs> They have to understand that their relationship with God has to be one that is holy. But it's not. Now, back in the, in the biblical times that we're talking about here, as we come to the close of the Old Testament, there was a king. And uh, they're going to put his name up here on the board, and I want you all to say that last name with me. Arnon. <laughs> <laughs> it's Artaxerxes, right? I think that's the correct name. But I honestly, whenever I read it, a different thing came out of my mouth every time. So I'm not sure what's going to come out when I say this name. But, but we're going to call him King Art. <laughs> you like that, right? So King Art was a, a, a Persian king. He was in Iran. And he actually uh, was a king that took over because his brother... Uh, king Darius murdered his father, who was the king. And since King Art didn't really like that King Darius murdered his dad, King Art got a whole bunch of guys together and murdered his brother. And uh, he got to be the king. And yet, when you go through all of that stuff, King Artaxerxes was a good king. <laughs> I don't you love the Bible? The Bible, you know, I always say, you know, why make up lies? The truth is so cool. <laughs> and so we're looking at here, and so we got this king now that is a really good king. And for the longest time, the Israelites had what they called in their history a righteous remnant. And this righteous remnant was about 7,000 or so Israelite men who were held captive in Iran, in the area of Iran, and they were basically slaves, if you will, to King Art. And King Art had come in favor with one of the prophets that we read about in the Bible. And his name is Ezra. Now, Ezra is a lot easier to remember than King Art. So, so we, got, we got Ezra. And Ezra basically had come in really great favor with um, the king. 
And the king said, you know what I'm going to do? I want you, Ezra, to take your people back to your country. Wow. God said that he would restore them and allow them to return to Israel. And here is this guy who's the good king, didn't necessarily get into the kingship, uh, if you will, in in very nice and, 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 and noble ways, but he's the king, and he likes the Israelites. Matter of fact, he was a king that basically said, I don't care who you worship. It doesn't matter to me, just as long as you obey the fact that I'm the king. And people liked him because of that. But the Israelites reminded him over and over again, we only worship the one true God. And so he said, I like that about you guys. I want to send you back to your home country. And here's what I'm going to do. Ezra, I want you to take all of the Israelites, and I want you to take them back to Israel, to the temple, to Jerusalem. But here's the other thing I'm going to do. I'm going to give you all the money you need for the trip. Not only that, I'm going to give you all the money that you would need to take care of whatever it is that you need once you get back there. And when it all comes down, I'm going to give you all that we took from Israel when we overtook you. I'm going to give it all to you. Here's the only thing that I ask you to do. I ask you to make sure that you, you take care of the people. Buy the necessary livestock you need. Buy the necessary things you need to plant crops. Make sure that you establish what you need. And then if there's anything left over, you guys decide what you need to do with it. Wow. No wonder everybody thought this guy was a really cool king. (laughs) So Ezra did that. And he went back to Jerusalem. And when we got there, he saw that the temple was in good shape. 100 years before... They had built the, They had rebuilt the temple. And when he got there, the temple had not been destroyed. After they basically took over the Israelites, they maintained the temple. The difference was, it was a building. They did not maintain the law. They did not maintain the culture of the righteous relationship between God and man. And so... As they came back to Jerusalem, Ezra found, he brought his righteous remnant with it, but he found that all of the people there had fallen into this despisable sin in the eyes of God. And even in the scriptures that we read, it says, and God was angered by this. Now, what happens when God is angered? Usually it's not very good. Usually it's not very good. So he is angered by the fact that the people who called themselves Jewish, Israelites, that remained behind had basically chosen to worship the gods of all the people who took over this land. So just like the king had said, I don't care who you worship. As long as you remember I'm the king, And he called himself the king of kings, King Art. They get back to Jerusalem, and all of the Israelites now are just marrying people who their families and everybody else are so into idol worship and all sorts of hedonism and everything that goes with it that this angers God. And so, so. Ezra begins to teach the people about the fact that you can't be like that. You have to worship the one true God, and you have to follow his law, the law that was established by Moses, the Mosaic law, which I, at the very beginning of this thing, we all read together. That was the whole crux of the matter of you take the Ten Commandments, you take all the, the, uh, the, lo- the Jewish laws and customs, and you put them all into a couple of verses, and that's the couple of verses that we need to remember, that we need to be in a covenant relationship with God. So Ezra began to 
with the righteous remnant that he brought back from, from uh, the uh, uh, Persian area, they began to change the culture in the community of Israel. And it wasn't easy. Can you imagine how difficult it is to come in and tell your in-laws, what you're doing is not right. Now, I just spent 10 days with my in-laws. And I can't imagine for one minute being able to tell my mother-in-law that she was wrong. Anybody have any success doing that? I'm taking notes. You know, please let me know. But, you know, the reality is that people are set in their ways. They believe that the way they're doing it is right, and it is almost impossible to change someone. And so here comes Ezra with this task of reminding them is, yes, I know that this is the way you're doing it now, but let me tell you how it was when I was young. Hmm. Difficult. And the other thing that he found there was that the wall surrounding the temple had been destroyed. And it was destroyed by these very same armies. They left the temple, but they certainly tore apart the wall. The wall, I don't know, has anybody been to Israel? Colette and I have been to Israel, and we've seen the wall, and it's not this small wall. You know, in some places, it's literally as thick from here to the parking lot. And it's really, really tall. You know, like 20, 30 stories tall, I guess. It's a huge mammoth thing. They actually have cities inside the wall at places. It's rather, rather interesting. But the wall was destroyed. And so that wall offered the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem and the temple protection. And the kings of these other surrounding communities, now I mentioned too, Lebanon and Hamas and, and uh, I mean, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Gaza has Hamas. But think of all these little tiny countries that are around. Right now you got Jordan, you got Syria, you got Egypt, you got uh, Iran. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting place. And all of these campments had little fragments of other campments that were all around the city. And walls protected the cities. And as you go to all these different cities, you'll see that they have these great big walls that they allowed in people in and out through a, a small gate. And that helped with protection. Nehemiah had, had, is another of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. And he gets excited. He gets an impassion. He gets a call from God that he needs to go and rebuild the wall. And so he goes and asks King Art, do you mind if, if I go and do that? Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. Why don't I pay for it? I like Art. He was really a, an awesome king. But you know, here he sends Nehemiah down and he gives him the resources that he needs to build this wall. And he says, you know, here, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> excuse me, get the absolute best people to build this wall. Take, your, take the best. Don't just take a few. Take the best. And so they go, but when they get there, they're, they're ridiculed, they're laughed at, they're, they're harassed, and, and they're being harassed by all these other countries that say, you can't rebuild that wall. We tore it down so, so well, you'll never rebuild it. Nehemiah says, I'll rebuild it because God told me to rebuild it. And so they began to rebuild it. And as they began to rebuild this wall, it was very much like a microcosm of what Ezra had begun to do to rebuild and establish the law for the people. Now this symbol of protection around Israel is being built, and it's being built in a really fast amount of time. These people, they gathered them all, and everybody worked on the wall. But you know what? The doubters began to hate them for that. They saw that they were making progress, and so they, they started to, to send their people to come and do this. But they also knew that God was, help, was behind them to make the wall, and they remembered the stuff from before that we talked about in the story. You know, when God was behind it, people, things happened. Like, you know, rivers closed in on top of, top of Aaron, and there was a pillar of fire, and all the people died, and all sorts of, they remembered all of those things of God. 
and they didn't want to interfere. But Nehemiah also knew that he had to protect his people. So he split the teams in half. And half of them were on protection duty, and half of them built the wall, and they built this in 27, uh, around the 24 hours around the clock. Pretty cool. But they did it in 52 days. 52 days! You know how long it took to build the Croc Center? We, we built the Croc Center in, in a measly old 19 months. And then it took uh, another year for the punch list to get completed. That's like three years, three and a half years for us to get it all done. And I want to tell you, it's still not all done. But they rebuilt the wall. How cool was that? And the people began once again to understand the relationship, the importance of that relationship with God. Is when they're in a right relationship with God, they are blessed. In so many ways, they're blessed. But when they're not in a right relationship with God, all sorts of calamity and hardship and grief and suffering is the norm. And yet when we look at these covenant relationships over and over and over and over again, we realize that we really don't like it very good. We're not really too satisfied when we're in the right relationship with God. I think as humans, maybe we think we know better than God knows what's best for us. So we do our own thing. Anybody done their own thing? I'm the worst at that. <laughs> I, I think I know everything. Matter of fact, my grandson had a t-shirt. My daddy's smart, but my grandfather knows everything. And, and that was my favorite t-shirt, I gotta tell you. But you know, Malachi comes along. And these all guys came right around the same time, Ezra, Nehemiah, and now Malachi comes along. And Malachi, everybody knows Malachi because, you know, they, they, whenever there's a tithe sermon that goes on in the church, in the history of the church, they go right to Malachi chapter 3 and says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse and everything's going to be great. And the preachers love preaching that message because they think their budget's going to be balanced if everybody would just do that. But the sad part is that's really got nothing to do with... <laughs> the whole Malachi chapter 3. Malachi came to basically speak to the priests, the leaders, the Levites, the, the ones who were in charge of the religious order, the ones who were in charge of keeping the covenant, the teachers, the, the, the rabbis, um, helping them to understand. And he came to them and he began to tell them that the Lord isn't pleased with you. He's not happy with you at all. What do you mean, not happy? Why isn't he happy? And there's some things in, in Malachi that, that are really interesting that jump out. It says, uh, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And this is uh, uh, Malachi speaking. And then they, they respond back by saying, how have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord. And he is pleased with them. Or where is, where is God? Where is the God of justice? What have you heard in our society? What have you heard in the world? It's almost like it's being preached from the mountaintops right now. It's being shown on TV. And it's like everything's okay. It's all okay, and we should accept it. We should accept the fact that people are not in a right relationship with God, and it doesn't matter. God is saying, yes, it does. And he's telling the leaders, and you need to stand up and say it does, no matter what the consequence. God is reminding them of this. But then he says, you know, I'll also show you another way that you're not in a right relationship with God. You see, it says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse. Did you know he's actually talking to the priests? 
when you read that particular portion of Scripture? Because the people that Ezra had spoke to and Nehemiah had spoke to had begun to do that. And they would bring lambs and animals and, and, and calves and, and grain and all sorts of fruits and vegetables. They would bring them. And God said, you need to take 10% of that and you need to bring it to the temple. And you need to make the sacrifices in the temple that are required in the Mosaic law. And here's what they were doing. They would look at the one that had the sprained foot. And that's the one that they would choose to sacrifice. Or they would look at the one that was blind. And that's the one that they would choose to sacrifice. Or they would use the fruit or the tomatoes that were slightly bruised and they would bring him in. Or they would take the ones that were rotted and they would lay them on the altar. And they started to just rip off the temple. But the other part of this was they were taking those really good ones and they were putting them in their backyard. They took those ripe vegetables and put them on their table. And God was saying, those are for me. Those are for my ministry. Those are for the needs of the people that I'm taking care of. And you're robbing me of those things. And you're teaching my people that that's okay. And I'm telling you right now, it's not. You see, when we get to a position where we understand the value and the importance of our relationship with God and how it affects every other thing that we do in life. Not just the things that we want God to do for us, but when we get to the place and we understand that our relationship with God is the absolute foundation for everything else that we're about, and we cherish that, and we guard that, and we do everything we possibly can to maintain that, that is when God chooses to bless his people. Covenants. Talked about the fact that yesterday friends got married. They knelt at the altar said their vows they walked out the building as husband and wife I wonder how God would have looked upon them if last night she went and slept with someone else and he went and slept with someone else and then somebody said to them well that's okay not but you see as as gross as that sounds on your wedding night that is really how it became in the relationship with God and his people they began to do everything that God detested and the priests said well that's okay just keep bringing stuff to the storehouse my friends what is holding you back from bringing your very best to God? What is keeping you from saying, everything that is about me, everything that is about my being is God's? And I and him, we have this relationship with no matter what I want to do right in his eyes. It affects my relationship with other people. It affects my finances. It affects my decisions. It affects, affects my relationship with my spouse. It reflects, reflects my relationship with my boyfriend, with my girlfriend. It reflects everything that I do. It reflects whether I want to cheat on my taxes or whether I want to rip off a client or whether I want, 
You see, when my desire is to be more and more like him, everything else comes into line. That's our challenge today. What has to take place in all of our hearts so that we can get this right? That's what Ezra was talking about. That's what Nehemiah was talking about. That's what Malachi was talking about. And after they said it, God fell silent for 400 years. I don't ever want him to go silent again. I'm going to ask if we can close our service in a time of prayer. Music's going to play. They're going to they're going to come. But as they come, I really want us to be in a prayerful mind. What is it that you know that is separating you right now from that righteous relationship with God? Whatever it is, are you willing to make it right? Are you willing to make it right? God as a Savior. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore your relationship with Him and make it holy. I invite you to come and kneel and pray and ask His Holy Spirit to restore you to righteousness.